I started sharing with you about the sermon, Mercy, Mercy Me. Mercy, Mercy Me. Because the world is short on mercy. Or let me put it like this. The church, the kingdom of God is short on mercy. Luke chapter 10, 25 to 37. All right. So it says, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And so he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You will never have problems. I will never have problems if we can do this. There will be no room for the devil to get into your life. Nothing. There will be no opportunity for Satan to get into your life to wreak havoc. So, you know what I'm beginning to think, and I'm talking about us, church. I'm talking about me, and I'm talking about you. When we have all these troubles and these challenges and these trials and these tribulations and these things that trip us up and all of these things that goes in our, on in our lives and when the devil steals from us, when the enemy steals from us and he takes stuff from us, it's because maybe we are not loving God with all our heart. And maybe we are not loving God with, you know what, with all our soul. And maybe we are not loving God with all our strength. And maybe we are not loving God with all our mind. And maybe we are not loving our neighbor because we cannot love ourselves. And so we can't love our neighbor. So you and me, we should be a work in progress. We should be working hard to love God 100%. With our minds, with our souls, with all of our strength, with everything that possesses us, and love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And so, in order for us to do all of this, we have to love ourselves first. Because if you can't love yourself, you can't love God. And you can't love your neighbor. Amen? So, we are work in progress, you and I. We are. And you know what? Can I tell you something? That the more we love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength and our neighbor as ourselves, we become very powerful people. Very powerful, very anointed people. And you know what? We'll cause the devil to run and to scatter in Jesus' name. Amen. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he wanting to justify himself said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, which is like I said to you this morning, it's a day's wages. Gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him and whatever more you spend. When I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. It's a command. Go and do likewise. So this morning, um, you know, this morning I said to you, don't run from the process that leads to your promotion. Don't run from the process that leads to your promotion because there was an opportunity for the priest and the Levite to help somebody that would have created promotion in their lives from heaven. I'm not even talking about man. You know what? Because this was almost like a private affair. You know, it, you, there were three things 
that, that happened at different times, at different stages. The priest came first. He saw that there was something going on there on the other side that was tumultuous. He saw that this thing on the other side required a little bit of uh, energy, strength, and putting your hand in your pocket and all of those kind of things. And so we walked over to the other side. The Bible says the Levite came, he saw the same situation, the man was lying there um, on the side of the road, he was bleeding, he was wounded, the Bible says left or half dead. The Levite came, walked up to the man, had a look at what was going on, saw the blood running, saw the broken arm, saw the broken face, saw everything, and the look shook his head and moved on. And then the Samaritan came, who's not a Jew, the Samaritan who is regarded by Jews as dirty, unclean, um, not worthy of drinking water from the same cup, came along and stopped. And I read the story and took compassion on the man and pour, poured oil and wine on his wounds and bandaged him and put him on his donkey. And he walked. I don't know how far he walked. But he put the man on his donkey. A stranger. Somebody he didn't know. Somebody who was not of the same religion. Somebody who was not of the same race. Of the same ethnicity. He took the man, put him on his donkey. And went to find an inn. And spoke to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. Look after him. And he gave him money ahead of time. And he said, and if this money is not enough, by the time I come back, I will reimburse you. A total stranger. An absolute stranger. Because this thing here was about a matter of the heart. That's what it was about. It was about humanity. It was about a conscience. It was about conviction. It was about being a brother's keeper. It was about a lot of things, but most of all what it was about was that God moved a heart. That's what it was about. Amen, church? He moved a heart. Next one quickly. May we hold strong convictions and gentle opinions. We'll talk about that later on. May we hold strong convictions and gentle opinions. Strong convictions and gentle opinions. We'll talk about that in point number three. And then the last one quickly. Influence is not about position or power. It is about the relational capacity to shape people's ideas, narratives, and behavior. Amen? Let me tell you something. The person, the people that have the most influence on your life growing up are teachers. This is the type of influence you can have on somebody. Good influence or bad influence. People will remember you for what you do or for what you do not do. It's as simple as that. Number one, I said, I have become my brother's keeper because of the character of Jesus Christ. I have become my brother's keeper. Amen. Number two, I said to you, and we stopped there. I said, the priest was a, a man of God, but he did not care about God's men. And I really mean God's people. He was a man of God, but he did not care about God's people. And so, number three, the heart of man describes the man. Amen? Not your position, not your influence, not your power. Amen? Not your knowledge, not your education. The heart of man describes the man. Amen? So, the priest was described by his heart. He had a cold heart. He did not care. All right? He was, he was interested in the ministry, but he was not interested in the people of the ministry. He, he was described. His heart described him. Listen, our hearts speak before our mouths speak. Our hearts speak before our actions speak. Amen? Our heart speaks. What does the Bible say? Guard your heart with all diligence, 
for out of it flows the issues of our lives. Amen, church? And so, you know what? Can I tell you something? And, and me included, Jerome included here, every day, every day, we've got to check our hearts. If it's still okay, if it's still good, if it's still in the same place, if it's better than what it was yesterday, because our hearts describe us. You know what? If you're constantly saying hurtful things to people, it's because you're a hurt person. Yeah. Amen. If you can, if you, if you constantly encouraging other people and help, like what you saw up here tonight, you know what? If you can, 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 can encourage people, guess what? You're an encourager. That's who you are. And that's what you do to other people. You impart your DNA into them if they want it. It's, it's about the heart. It's all about the heart. Amen. Like, do you really think, do you really think that God is interested in somebody that wants to come to the temple and do ministry while his creation is lying dead in the gutter or half dead or going to die if somebody doesn't give help? That guy was going to die if that Samaritan didn't come about. But here's what I want to say to you. We need to find a way to win. You find a way to win. Amen, church? Because God is not going to overlook the fact that we are overlooking our fellow man. So, let's quickly look at this. The Levite cared enough to look but not to help. The priest showed no interest. The Levite showed partial interest. Does it sound familiar? You cannot give what you don't have. Amen. You can't give compassion if you don't have compassion. You can't give love if you don't have love. You can't give caring if you don't have caring. You cannot have what you don't give. Sometimes you first have to give before you can have. You understand what I'm saying? You, you, you don't have love, but you give love so that you can get love. Amen, church. A cold art in ministry is a brutal art. People are described by the things they do and do not do. By the things they say and do not say. That's how we are described. For the past couple of months now, we've been busy with the art in this church. I don't know if you've picked it up by now. That we've been speaking about the art. Because if we don't speak about the art and the art doesn't gravitate to where God is, then we are just wasting our time as a church. Am I right? And so, let's go to point number four. The champion is not the one who is great, but the one who does the will of God. That's the champion. You can look at any great man in the Bible, and you're going to find that the champion was the one who did the will of God. David, Samuel, Jeremiah, all of these guys. The champion in them was because they did the will of God. Now I'm going to tell you, the champion in the story between the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan was the Samaritan. Because it was the Samaritan that did the will of God. Amen. Listen, coming to church is not doing the will of God. Coming to church is your reasonable service. That's all it is. It's your reasonable service. Because the Bible says that we must not neglect the gathering of the saints. Amen. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. What does it bring? Refreshing and anointing. Amen. Why do you need refreshing and anointing? You need refreshing and anointing to become a champion. Amen. To do the will of God. You cannot do the will of God without refreshing and anointing. Amen. And so that is why we always have to be refreshed. So let us quickly look at the Samaritan quickly and close. You see, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is way better than sacrifice. Amen. But you see, you know what? If you constantly show up for church, constantly like, like you guys do, you constantly show up for church, it is your heart describing you. Your heart is saying you love the fellowship of the saints. Your heart is saying you love the presence of God. You don't have to run away. You know what? People who smoke run away from the presence of God. People who drink run away from the presence of God. People who commit adultery run away from the presence of God. People who lie run away from the presence of God. Amen. 
Eh? People who generally do sin don't like to be in church. They don't like it because every time they come to church, they are convicted by the word that comes. And they don't like that feeling of conviction. And then they say, who does he think he is this pastor? Why does he preach like that? Does he always have to preach like that? Yes. He always has to preach like that. Because he's fighting for your soul. He has to preach like that. You can hate him. But in heaven you will love him. Because he's fighting for your soul. Because hindsight is 2020 vision. You can't see what's taking place right now. But you will see it when you look back one day and you say, Ah, okay. That's what that preacher was trying to do. Number one. The Samaritan was not a Jew, but he chose to care for a Jew. In other words, he could have been a Muslim. He cared for the Jew. The Jew didn't want to care for the Jew. The priest. The Levite, who was a Jew, did not want to care for the Jew. But the Samaritan cared for the Jew. There's something to be learned there, isn't there? Huh? Number two. The Samaritan was not of the same religion, but he chose to care for someone outside of religion. The Samaritan was not of the same religion, but he chose to care for someone outside of his religion. Number three, the Samaritan had a heart that could take pity, and he took pity. He gave mercy. He gave grace. He allowed his heart to speak for him. He allowed his heart to dictate for him. He did not even know that he was walking in the presence of God. Under the anointing. He didn't even know it. Because whenever you do, listen, you need to understand that the devil can do nothing good. There is no good thing that Satan can do. He cannot. So when any person does something good for someone else, they are acting on God's behalf. They cannot be compassionate, take pity, be kind, and act on the devil's behalf. It is impossible, church. So we need to hold gentle opinions. Amen. Number four. Never judge a book by its cover. The contents may astound you. Never, listen, you know what? Any Jew looking, any Jew that was looking before the Samaritan got there, any Jew that was looking would have said, I guarantee you, I will give you a million rand. I, I bet you that Samaritan is going to walk right past. Because it is not his duty to stop. It is not his people. That he needs to stop for. It's not his religion that he needs to stop for. But this Samaritan stopped. You see God takes the foolish things of this world. To confound the wise. He takes the foolish things of this world. To confound the wise. Number five. The Samaritan changed his schedule. For a complete stranger. He, he, he was a businessman. He was going somewhere. He had goods with him. The Bible said he had wine and oil that he poured onto the man's wounds. He also had money on him. Amen. He was a businessman. He was going somewhere to do some business to conclude. But when he found this person, his day changed. His whole day changed. He changed his schedule and it wasn't a schlep. It was not a problem for him to change his schedule. He changed his schedule. Wherever he was going, he decided he's not going. In the natural fact, if you really think about it, he put the man on his donkey and he turned around and he went back the way he came to find an inn. He changed his schedule. The priest was not prepared to change his schedule and neither was the Levite. But the Samaritan, he changed his schedule. Number six, he spent money and resources on someone he did not know. 
He spent money and resources. He gave the two denarii. He used his oil. He used his wine. On the wounds, he spent money on someone he did not know. We want to make the world a better place. This is how you do it. You want to make the world a better place? This is how you do it. More than preaching. This is how you do it. More than preaching. Number seven. He took care of the wounded man's future. He took care of the wounded man's future. You know what? That, Mar- that Samaritan was responsible for that wounded man's continued life. He'd have bled out there on the side of the road. He would have bled out. The Bible says when he got to him, he immediately poured wine and oil on his wounds and bandaged him. You know what? When you begin to bandage somebody, you stop the blood from running out of somebody's body. You can do even a, a tourniquet. He might have done that. But you know what? He helped that man to have a future. Simple things, eh? He took care of the wounded man's future. He didn't just take care of him right there where he was to stop the bleeding. No, 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 no. He put him on his donkey. He changed his schedule. He went back the way he came. He found an inn. He spoke to a man. He said, please. He said, please. Take care of this man, please, man. Sir, what's his name? I don't know. I don't know what's his name. I don't know. I haven't spoken to him. He's been unconscious since I met him. (laughs) But I tell you what, listen. Yes, two denarii. Won't you please take care of him? The two denarii is for the stay and for his food and for you changing the bandages tomorrow. And if it goes a third day and I'm not back, when I come back, I will pay you the rest. Now, he might not have had to pass back that way. Because maybe, just maybe, he was doing a round trip. Remember, he was going to do business. Just maybe he was doing a round trip. But he said, I'll be back. Listen, the man's word was his honor. And here we sit in the church and judge. And we have opinions. And we are opinionated. And we want to argue about doctrine. And people are dying on the side of the road. Number eight and in conclusion. He got heaven's attention. He got heaven's attention. Because Jesus spoke more about the Samaritan than what he spoke about the Levite or the priest. He got heaven's attention. And actually there was a conversation between the God of heaven and a lawyer. And it went like this. And so who was neighbor to the man who fell because of the thieves? He got heaven's attention and the blessing that goes with it. He taught lessons through his actions which should be common in ministry. I hope that I challenged and moved your heart today. I hope that when you see something that needs attention, Evan's attention, when you, that you know what? That you will give it your attention. I want to tell you something as I close the sermon. That what might be a little thing to us is not really a little thing to God. The man in the gutter to some people might be a little thing, but not to God. Because according to him, that person is skillfully and wonderfully made. The Ruach of God has been blown into him, like you know in Genesis. It has been blown into him, into every person. Nobody's a waste, and nobody's wasted. Nobody. Amen.
Maybe you just want to have a deeper relationship with him this morning because you haven't been. We want to pray with you. Won't you stand? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have touched my heart. I thank you for your spoken word. And God, I respond to you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins and to remove it as far as the east is from the west. That you will put it, Lord, into the sea of forgetfulness. I now receive you as my Lord and as my master. I am your child. I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you honor. I magnify your name. Amen.